As I just uh, expressed to you about the digitization, um, a good example of, of what we would like to see and way we want to move forward uh, is in the uh, digitization of the ship's registers. Now I'm going to backtrack here a minute so that I can bring you up to speed. Uh, this, this is probably one of the more important projects that we have as a Canadian to be able to support and go after and it's in, it's, it's, it's in the public domain. And it, when I retired in 2009, the, uh, in coordination with the Fish Museum of the Atlantic, located here in Lunenburg, Nova Scotia, a good, good place to visit, by the way, it's a phenomenal museum, uh, asked me to catalog, find and catalog a vessel that is called the Cape Island Longliner. It's, it's unique to Nova Scotia. They went from between 45 and 60 feet, and they were they were brought together in uh, under the uh, Federal Fishing Vessel Assistance Program. And, and those on the West Coast who know what that also affected you, it was during the war, it was a war measures implementation uh, put in, in, in uh, excuse me, in, into, into uh, practice because uh, a lot of the vessels went to the Fisherman's Reserve. Uh, there was a need for fish, there was a need for food. And uh, they actually started subsidizing the construction of sailors and whatever. It became a very contentious program. In fact, I have a book being published next year that I take and look at this from end to end. So I won't, I won't uh, cover that in any respect. Anyway, uh, during that period of time, I had to go to a place to find the vessels and the requirements. One of the requir there were several requirements that had to be in that vessel to get that, uh, that assistance. There was a length, there was a sort of thing, there was the construct of the standards and the requirement for a certain number of bulkheads to be stalled in this fishing vessel. Watertight bulkheads that came up to the, to the decks uh, to, for water integrity. And not all of the 45 vessel, foot vessels had it. Um, as a result, to find them, I had to go and spend considerable time in the Dartmouth registry. This would be the registry of a local registry office that contained the registers, the actual registers of the, the, the registration of fishing vessels. And, and it was about, in that library, they covered everything from uh, New Brunswick, Prince Edward Island and Nova Scotia. And they got, went back to, oh, some of them went back to 2000, or expression, uh, the 1900 and, and, below, and, be, and before. Some I saw there went back in, in Windsor and places that they, these registry offices now closed. Anyway, uh, I got to know the registers quite well. And in doing the registers, it came is that this document or these documents were the, probably the most important document you could ever have when you're looking at research. It is the birth and death certificate of a vessel. It'll tell you who the ownership was. It'll give you its rig. It'll tell you if the rig changed. A good example of that is there was a registry change made in the late 1930s when our famous Blue Nose was taken off as being a sailing ship and, and called a motor vessel because at that time, before the, uh, her last race, which they had to take the engines out again, she was fitted with two diesel engines. That was the changes that were occurring. Once she had her sail back again, they had to re-register her back or did put a change that she was not a fishing vessel or a schooner. She was now uh, back to a motor vessel to a fishing vessel. So. Those are the things that are in the register they can tell you. They tell you all kinds of things. Anyway, um, about, my wife and I spent about probably between 1600, between 1600 and 18 hours collectively in the register. We found these vessels that we wanted. We got quite familiar with the, with the crowd there and, and the people working. And, and we got very familiar with the register. We also found out that these registers are great big books. They're right out of Oliver Twist. You know, they're like the old ledgers you'd, you'd see in an old 1800. You can always have two guys and a boy to lift up the register. And they're all, up until their time of typewriters, they were all beautifully hand scripted and, and built that way. But coupled with that was a thing called an index card. And uh, this index card was a copy of what was in the registry. And they had to be sent to Ottawa to the central registry. Uh, to the Department of Transport as we are Transport Canada as we know it now, but there was all kinds of different things that were there at the time that were a little different. Um, 
I'm going to be sending a, 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 a copy of this to, to for, for John, but this is an index card of a vessel. And this, vest, this, this index card, uh, which is a copy of the register, gives you all kinds of information. It tells you, like, for example, it confirms that this particular vessel uh, went ashore, was driven ashore on the island Madeline Islands on uh, 19, 1957. And that gives you the documentation. It tells you its rig. It tells you who the builder is. It tells you where it was. You can follow that vessel all the way through. Anywho, it was from that documentation I was be able to compile what was needed for their research. I did the research for their records. They had, we found 205. There could have been more, uh, but the story is because of what I'm going to tell you next. In 2012, just about the time I was ready to write the report and go back, I got a call uh, one bright fine day from a young lady and she was very distressed. She called me and she says, Don, she says, I got to talk to you. She says about the ship's register. And she was from the registry's office. She says, I got, we got notification today that they're closing this office. Well, technically I figured that might happen, you know, and again, talking with digitization, the ability to register vessel online and whatever. But she said, they want to get rid of the, with the, uh, the, the registers. Now at that point, that's that's what I heard. So um, this is 2012. I started uh, searching around and seeing what I could find, and I did find out that in fact, yes, there was a program that uh, was kept quite hush hush. Uh, nobody seemed to know about it. Where all of a sudden they were going to take these registers and uh, move them. They were going to be coming not the property of Transport Canada, they were going to be the property of Library Archives Canada. And they were going to be, we, the first thing that I heard from these people is that, oh, they are going to be, they've got digitization, so they might, they might get rid of them. Well, that's wrong because anybody in Canada knows that any document, public document, such as the registers, digitized or not, the originals have to be kept. They have to be maintained. So that, that was a, a problem number one. So where do I start? I uh, called around, called around, talked to Transport Canada. Um, it was mum. No one seemed to know what was going on with these registers. So I went and uh, got a hold of a member of parliament for the Lunenburg area. I'm, I'm in the valley, but I, I knew that he'd be close to that area and he was very i knew him as a very good mp and he was also part of at that time the conservatives were in power so he was part of the caucus and uh, he wrote a couple letters off to the transport minister and uh, the transport minister came back and gave us assurances and i had the letter sitting right here in front of me that those those documents would be remaining in the province um well, they did. Uh, about two or three weeks, maybe later, we got another co uh, co correspondence say, look, we're not happy with it. Why can that they go to a facility such as the Maritime Museum of the Atlantic or whatever? The argument there was politically, uh, that's a provincial thing. These are federal documents. What is so surprising is that I can go to any museum here in the province that has a federal input and I can find all kinds of documentation that is on permanent loan from LAC, yet they would not see fit to put these in a provincial library such as the Bedford Institute of Oceanography Library. So the fight starts. Um, I'm trying to find out about how we get access to keep them in the province. I fought with, I guess, every, every politician that was around. Um, until uh, 2014, I understand, got a call from uh, the uh, people at, uh, the, at the, uh, the registry, ships registry in Dartmouth. They said, uh, as of such and such a date, we will not own the documents. They will be going to uh, the sto federal storage facility in 
industrial park just just down the road from where they were uh, for storage. So um, I decided that I'd better call try to get a hold of LAC so that they would become the owners of it. Uh, so this was nigh on now we're starting to go into the next year this this thing this 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 thing has taken on a, a, a life all of a sudden i call up this lady who is the representative of lac for the province of nova scotia and i said look i have a letter here signed by the transport minister that said that these things should not be leaving the province that they should remain in the province uh, she said, I know nothing about it. Well, I figured she wouldn't, uh, but uh, they are not under their jurisdiction now. They belong to us and they are here. I said, oh, good, good. So we should be able to, can we set up an arrangement so people can come in there? Uh, no, they are, they are now subject to the, uh, the uh, Freedom of Information Act. That kind of got my hackles up. Here we have uh, a change of about 10 city blocks and they were open to the public at one facility. Now they went to LAC and they are now locked down. I fought that battle for three years, trying to get access to these documents. I've got binders full of correspondence between myself. I even went to the province of Nova Scotia. I had meetings with two ministers uh, who promised something they didn't. Um, and. Uh, I had talked with the Nova Scotia archives at the time and they were the individual at time and the charge at the time said, and I had the member of legislation assembly with me at the time said, no, 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 that is a federal matter. This is not provincial. You could not convince them that these documents are generated provincially. And it's by the act of confederation only that they act federally. They should have been in the province. So long story short, this went on for five years, 2017. Till one bright fine day about, oh, 2018, I uh, happened to be into the Nauticopedia website and I see some traffic going back and forth amongst some folks. And one of the, one of the situations that were, was going on at the time was, you people in the West Coast were having the same trouble as we were having here. They closed the Burnaby shop about 2017. And I understand for the same reason. And the reason was mice. Now it's funny. People in Halifax or in Dartmouth had a problem with mice. Well, Burnaby had trouble with mice and therefore they had to go to Ottawa for protection. Anyway, at that time, uh, my good friend, uh, John McFarland, pardon me for looking backward here. Uh, they were having problems to, uh, to put this together, to, to, to get in, get these registers set out. And one of his colleagues actually uh, wrote an article uh, along with he talking about how we should be running, how documents should be handled by LAC, where these registers should be. About that time, I picked up that article and I went down to the uh, well-known politician's office. It was our MP at the time, Scott Bryson, and uh, his office. And I, I stomped on their doors at more than once uh, till finally uh, they made contact and asked some questions. I said, look, they got a problem out in the West Coast. This is not just unique here. So we made contact uh, with a couple more people from uh, British Columbia. And uh, all of a sudden, the next thing you know, John and I started talking and we said, we've got to handle this this way. So uh, God bless John. He, he did a, a great job. And then with his foresight in, 29, in 2020, uh, we, or 2019, we started writing letters to the uh, LAC director. The first ones didn't come over too good, but the response was inaccurate. And in fact, it was kind of embarrassing because their staff did not do the job and approve what we were saying correct, that the sites were not accurate. So by the August of 2019, uh, after a lot of pushing, pulling and jumping up and down, uh, John and I were able to show that this was not unique to Nova Scotia. It was not unique to British Columbia. 
this is people from Canada speaking. And uh, we started and we got the uh, program together to digitize it. Um, one of our first tasks in digitizing these was to teach the archivists what was in the registers. Now the registers, if you ever, those of you who looked at registers, um, know that the construct of the register is a little unique. It has a lot of information in, in, in different form. Like you don't have the date of registration, you have the number 18 of 1960 in Lunenburg would be, uh, you know, that would be the 18th vessel recorded in Lunenburg in, in that year. Uh, so you had to teach them and say, this is how you read the documentation and how and what do you hold? Before we started anywhere, we had to find out what they held. Uh, it was about that time uh, in the fall, I guess, of 2019 or so, we started finding out that they had a cooperative effort with a, a Heritage Canadiana or Canadiana Heritage. And we found that there was a number of microfilm reels that were already there online, but there was no catalog to them. You, if you were looking for a vessel, you had to start at one and go all the way to the bottom. And I think it was 20, 25 reels on there. So we started negotiating with, with LAC and I said, look, this, this is not an, a real, pro this is not a difficult situation. First of all, the way that you have documentation now, you're going to have to have somebody from other places in Canada, from British Columbia all the way to St. John, Newfoundland, because they lost theirs too, come to you at $30 an hour or whatever they would charge for a, a contractor, or if you went there yourself, and it's not the cost of being fine at getting access to these documents is exorbitant. We have the technology within house to be able to do it. So we convinced some of their middle management to, to take a look at a trial. And I think at that point in time, they were kind of looking and saying, maybe if they find out they can't do it, uh, they'll go away. But we ended up with uh, a, 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 a good, good staff in the digitized world with uh, this uh, young lady who uh, came to, came and started working with us. And her first question is, says, what do you want? And that's a great thing to have. Now, Melody Brown was the one that did it. God bless her. She said, what do you want? How do, how do you, how, how do we make this work? My background, I've had some background in, in uh, distance learning when I was doing with the Air Force. And that's the question, that's the questions we like to hear. So John and I started looking at the scope of the project. We scoped it out and said, what we need to have is somebody can take that index card and they can give it by the official number, the name, or the port of registry. Not only that, we want you to be able to link that from the port of registry through its life. I have a vessel that was sold in Victoria. It sails all the way around the Horn and it comes into Halifax. Then it goes to St. John's, Newfoundland eight years later. I have to have a system that somebody simple can get into. And this is what we try to use as a baseline. And I'll, you'll see one on, online when I send it to John here in the, next, in the coming days. But that's what we want to have. We want to have this to be able to go and you as a researcher can go in and say, I think that that vessel was in Barrington Passage, Nova Scotia. When you come up to Barrington Passage and hit it, when we were done, all the vessels that were registered in Barrington Passage come up. You hit that vessel, then it'll give you the index card, just like I have here. This is where this came from. This is a sample from our database. And there you go. There's the vessel right there till it died. Okay. This is so important to the researcher because the information gives you all kinds of stuff. So we started doing this. And now we're at the point we, we actually did some beta testing as people that are IT would understand. Uh, we took the, we took the, uh, we got a format similar to this. It can be hunt, hunted by this thing. They, they put this stuff in and we put 22,000 in there to see if it would work. 
And uh, John and I could not break it to the point that we, we thought we could. It came out very good. Now, having said that, um, one of the areas that we have to take a look at is uh, how, how we're going to get the rest on. Uh, COVID helped us, but it also hindered us. Uh, it hindered us being able to get the rest of the data put on there. Uh, there's 50,000 other entries waiting and there's 22 reels, there's 22,000 other ships that we are going to have to transpose, uh, get it ready to put on the database. Um, so that's, that's where we're kind of sitting right now in, in how, we're going to, how we're going to do this. Uh, it does work. Um, I've, I've tried it out. John has tried it out. We have a few little things that we have to kind of work with. Um, and I'll give you an example. When I call up a name, Karen Dawn, it's an actual vessel here in Nova Scotia that is sailed. There's another vessel. That Karen Dawn was Karen D-A-W-N. Would you know there's another vessel called the Karen and Dawn? And there is another vessel called the Karen Dawn, D-O-N. So what we've asked them to do, and they've, they've tried it, and it works pretty good, is to put anything with that name down the side in a side and a sidebar, which it allows it to drop down and give you some choices. Okay. Once you, you, once you uh, get in there, you'll find out the best you're looking for, but it works pretty good. So the next step for us is to keep plugging away and working with them. I, I have, uh, I have some, I have some, uh, I have some, reservations about their timelines uh, and I'm going to keep plugging at it. Uh, I maintain contact with uh, the young lady that I'm working with, uh, Miss, Miss, Miss uh, Melanie Blake or uh, uh, Maria Blake. She's an absolutely wonderful lady, uh, young, eager, wants to help as much as she can. But again, by the sheer volume, uh, they, they got behind because of COVID and wouldn't you know it that the, uh, the time that they were ready to come back to work on Wellington Street is where the facility and the technology is. Uh, they were held up by a trucker strike. Uh, now they're behind the eight ball on 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 and, and just backlog of equipment and or uh, uh, entry. So we're we're going to be working with that. So that's where we're at now. People have asked us why has can we get access? I'm going to answer that with yes and no. Um, there's 30,000 or 23,000, I think, entries out there uh, right now that we could, could access. The only trouble is, is how they mounted it. We, we wanted them to start from 1984 and work backwards, and I'll, I'll come back to that. Uh, from 1984 backwards. However, it was not possible to do it because to be able to make the entries go the way they wanted, what they wanted to do was to take the reels, as they came, mount them, uh, turn them all to PDF, and we're talking a lot of micro wheel uh, film, do the quality assurance, and then get them ready to go. So this reel might contain stuff from 1950 back to 1942, but then there could be a break between that and say 1970. So this is where we're, we're, we're we're, we're very skeptical because we don't want people to say, oh, well, they're not, they haven't got anything in there. No, there's a reason why we don't have everything in there. And it's because we are not to that stage where we, we can actually have everything mounted for you. But hopefully by the fall, we'll be able to do it. I have, I have entered our database and had some people enter it just, just to trial it on the, on the privileges that they know that what they're looking for may not be there. But this is what we're doing. This is just, we're in the infancy of this. Where do we go from here? <clears throat> well, our first priority is to complete this project, but we have another fight. When LAC, or not LAC, when Transport Canada went and turned things over to, uh, the documents over to LAC, the project implementation plan, which is the way they were supposed to do this project, it was probably put together in the back of a cigarette package, as far as I'm concerned, uh, because it just didn't it just didn't gel. What they did is in 1984, 
they went to a digit, digitized program. So it was more cost effective uh, than operating 13 or so different, different uh, offices. Uh, it allowed uh, now to contract out the, uh, the registering of vessels and that's happening here on the coast. There's people who are trained and they contract out to measure up vessels or inspect them and, and, and then input them. You can register smaller vessels yourself or any changes yourself. But what they failed to do when they did that is if any vessel was built from 19, let's say 1976 to say 75, that was alive and converted over via a change in 1984, 85, that registry was never closed. So a lot of the a lot of the entries that you're going to have come out of from that time period uh, could be still open, and why you know they're open? They're not signed off on the bottom. You know, so notice on this particular document on the bottom it tells you that the registry is closed. You will not see that statement on those documents. That's another hesitant we want to go. So our next scrap is to find out why, in heaven's name, is the Department of Transport or Transport Canada hanging on to historical data, be it by uh, digitized or however, from 1984, when those documentations could come over here and just be mounted because they're already digitized documents. There is no explanation. And in fact, I'm in the process now working with another, uh, as a pr private citizen with a local uh, member of parliament, and saying, I need an answer from the transport minister as to why they are, at, and by the way, they're charged of the public. Why are they think that, they're, that that should be going? And I'm trying to ask that in a very subtle way. I don't need people to get their back up at us. <clears throat> but what this does, right now we have got 40 years of data out there, 40 years of data that is waiting to go somewhere. If it happens to come to LAC, do they have the budget to mount it? Is anybody going to give them? And all of a sudden they get this, this, this raft of documentation and there's no head, heads up about it. And now what do they do with it? What do they do? How, how are they going to handle it? So we have a, a database of the historical documents now that's going to be free to the public that's over here. And meanwhile, <clears throat> we have another agency is trying to keep it going. So that's that's the that that's the that's the problem we see coming forward. It may be a simple matter of, of getting some understanding, but at the same token, I, I think that that's going to be we can get there. Uh, there are some other things that that are coming out of this. Uh, we have found, or, or I have found, and some other folks have found <coughs> that if I use. Uh, there's a way if I have a, a, a bad document, I can find it from, from, uh, from the ship's registry in, uh, in Transport Canada, especially if it's in that time period. If something's scratched all over it, you can't get it, or you can't make something out, uh, it will give you the official number, then you can come back and it, it'll, it'll give you what you need to do. So these are the things that we're doing right now. Um, do we need your help? Yes. For those that are researchers, Go talk to your local people. Don't mind. Don't be afraid to let the people know at LAC that this is a this is a worthwhile project, and it's going to be a way that we can maintain our history and save what we want to do. And and it's also going to be boon to the student. We have people in our universities on both coasts and co right now that are actually studying maritime studies, the studies of the history, and and the, and the economic impact of the marine industries fishing, whatever it happens to be, shipping, coasting, on both coasts. And there are people that are looking for this information because they're doing a thesis on these things for their master's degree. Right now it's expensive. So any support that we could have towards that, uh, by all means, uh, we do need it. Uh, and, and it's just, we're gonna plug along as long as I got breath in me to do this and, and see how we can go. And uh, it's been a pleasure uh, actually if you need something from us, let us know. I'll put you in contact with what I can or see what, see what I can answer. And I'm always there to help what I can do.